My name is Trevor Bernard. I'm the uh, director of the Wilbur Force uh, Institute. Um, and, and my own particular interest is in uh, something which is very close to what we're doing today, which is on uh, Caribbean, uh, Caribbean slavery and particularly on family history. Um, and we're doing this in a hybrid way, which means that we have uh, an audience at the Wilberforce Institute uh, and also quite a large audience at, on, on, online as well. So we want to encourage um, people both here and also in line to, online to, uh, to, to, to ask questions. Uh, if you're online and you want to ask a question, either uh, please, please put that in the chat function. Uh, which is easy, uh, on the right hand screen at the right hand end of your, of your screen. Uh, this will go to uh, Nick Evans who will um, convey that to the speakers. Uh, if you want to ask a question in person uh, while you're online, uh, please mention that to Nick as well uh, and he will be able to, to facilitate that. Um, so it's, it's, uh, we, we very much encourage people uh, online to, to ask questions as well as of course people in the audience here. Um, this is uh, a, a, an important event for us. We have uh, two very good speak, two, two great speakers, Alex Renton and Cecile Oxal, who are going to talk about uh, various aspects of uh, their family's history. Both have been researching their family's history uh, in relationship to the West Indies. We did hope, hope to have uh, Karen Okra, a, a great friend of the Wilberforce Institute, uh, but unfortunately she has uh, carer's responsibilities, which means that she's unable to come, but she gives, does give uh, her, her, her apologies for not being here. Um, but uh, but, she, but, but that, that does give us a bit more time, I think, for both Alex and Cecile uh, to talk about what they're, they're doing. Um, first of all, we'll, we'll, uh, I'll introduce Alex Renton, and then uh, after Alex talks, I'll introduce Cecile uh, briefly uh, to talk about the these particular, particular, um, uh, this particular things today. And just to mention, this is also part of uh, our Black History Month. Uh, we're taking the opportunity to say the 4th of November is still October. Um, somewhere in the world, maybe that's the case. Uh, but, it, but, but, but it has been the end of a, of a pretty interesting uh, set of lectures, exhibitions, a lot of activity at the Wilberforce Institute. And, and this is uh, uh, one of the culminations of it. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce Alex Renton, uh, who's a journalist working and uh, winning many awards for his investigative journalism, uh, both in Britain and also internationally. Uh, he's won, uh, won awards for, for investigative journalism, for war reporting, and for something quite different, uh, for food writing. Uh, he's also he's an author of, uh, of, a, of, a, of, of a number of important books. Uh, and one of which is joining us his own experience uh, in elite schools and the wealth of other research. Uh, he wrote a widely acclaimed, uh, also, but also quite controversial book called Stiff Upper Lip, Secrets, Crimes and the Schooling of the Ruling Class. Uh, very appropriate where we have uh, at the moment the heir to the throne, uh, the Prime Minister, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and I think until recently the head of armed forces all coming from one uh, school in Berkshire, my school, and the school that Alex went to as well. Um, that brutal honesty uh, in terms of his connecting an important theme in British history to his own history, uh, extended to his most recent book, which is going to be the subject of his, his talk tonight. Uh, one has got great reviews and recommendations from all sorts of people, uh, some of whom are well known to us, like Professors Di Patton, uh, Jeff Palmer, Sir Geoffrey Palmer and Catherine Hall. Uh, and he also from me, with, uh, I'm afraid, a rather banal column comment that it's a brilliant read. I think I should have done a bit better than that, but it is a brilliant read. <laughs> and this book deals with, as, as Alex will show, with his family's involvement uh, in slavery. Uh, the Fergusons, uh, from which uh, Alex uh, is a member of that, that family, are very distinguished servants of empire, uh, very important in, in, in terms of their history in Scotland, uh, as well as governors and governors general of New Zealand. Uh, their wealth and that of, of, of the associated uh, Hunter Blair family, which is also a subject of Alex's book, uh, came from several sources. But one of the most important sources uh, was slavery uh, in Tobago and in Jamaica. Uh, as Alex starts his riveting blood legacy, he starts by saying he's an heir of Britain's slavery past, uh, which is making, which has marked, which has marked his mind, his culture, and his DNA. So very pleased to welcome to the Wilberforce Institute Alex Renton uh, to talk about blood legacy, reckoning with a family's story of slavery. Alex. 
Thank you, Trevor, very much. Uh, it's very exciting to be here in next door to Wilberforce's birthplace. My ancestors knew Wilberforce very well, disagreed with him. Uh, and, and also to be introduced by Trevor, who, whose work in, I've admired and used more than I may have acknowledged in, in this book, which, I've, which was published in May. Um, and uh, and thank you. I, I my one thing. I don't have a watch or a clock. So will you will you nod to me when you I'm going to hand to Cecilia? When you start to and and Cecilia sometimes. <laughs> um, uh, and should we do? We're going to do questions after Cecilia. Right. And okay, great. great. So um, I thought I'd just um, start by just reading a page from the introduction of my book. I think it may be useful just to establish where I'm coming from in, in writing, you know, entering into this sort of field of the history of slavery, which I was completely innocent about, too innocent about five years ago, and uh, and also um, why, why I took this on. Uh, I am an heir of Britain's slavery past. It marks my mind, my culture, my DNA. I am a descendant of the owners of enslaved people and of traders in them, of a campaigner for the abolition of slavery and of an enslaved African woman. Like me, the Britain in which I grew up is a place shaped in no small way by transatlantic and plantation slavery and the many industries that thrived upon them. I am part of the legacy that lives on economically and culturally, visible not just in grand houses and old statues, but in the systemic and street level racism that afflicts our country today. Like most of us, I am a mess of differing inheritances, but the person I present to the world is pretty much the one formed by the wealthy people of my ancestry. As a white middle class Briton, I am so shielded from everyday racism, I rarely notice it. While most of the wealth my ancestors accrued was long ago spent, the privilege garnered from it still protects and supports me. The history of Britain and slavery worked and glossed to make it distant and irrelevant is the foundation of my comfortable liberal life. My family keeps archives. When I read the papers there that documented our forebears activities in the Caribbean, most of them carefully annotated and then covered up by my historian grandfather, I knew that the story they contained had to be brought to the light. I felt it wrong to keep the history from the descendants of the enslaved people who had worked and died on our plantations. When I uncovered this, most of the wider family, including my own children, knew nothing of this past. What I discovered profoundly challenged who I was, about the history I had been taught, and, Britain, and about Britain today. The papers make it possible to untangle some of what happened on my family's plantations in Tobago and Jamaica. But a huge hole will always remain where the accounts of the 950 or so people who were enslaved by my ancestors should sit. We have the direct testimony of just one of them. That fact renders this only half a narrative, one that hardly deserves to be called history. So it is the story of my mother's family, the Fergusons, their partners, the Hunter Blairs, and the Britain that not so long ago tolerated the enslaving of human beings for profit. It is also about the legacy, still toxic, still harming people, 180 years after emancipation in the British Caribbean. So what I thought I'd do is just run through the two families and, and then a bit about how this research project worked and became a book and, and, and then sort of in, enlarged a little on, on what I found. Um, so, so the chief figure uh, is Sir Adam Ferguson, who is my six times great uncle, and, and he and my five times great grandfather, does that make sense? Yes, um, uh, were the first investors in, along with another brother, James, um, in plantations in the Caribbean. And, and Sir Adam is, is you know, he's not, not the best known figure of the Scottish Enlightenment, but he's well known. He was a rector of Glasgow University. He was a member of parliament. He was a, a doctor of law, practicing lawyer and a big landowner. And, and, and he knew the figures of the time. He knew Adam Smith personally, he knew Hume. He, um, he was very much of his age and he was a Whig MP. 
so he sat at, 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 well, kind of a Whig MP. I mean, he was he was allied to Dundas and Pitt and, and that and that gang. So he was actually of, of, of the pro-abolition party and, and Wilberforce's party, but as a slave owner and indeed a part, you know, on one occasion, a slave trader direct from Tobago to West Africa, uh, he was, of course, against uh, abolition of the slave trade in 1792. And, and we have his recorded vote unusually in 1796, um, in the, 1790, the second 1796 vote against abolition. And the thing that from the beginning, in, so I was brought up, you know, I'm a member of the British upper class and I was brought up with a, under a, with a system of ancestor worship, which kind of thing we mock in other cultures, but we were very much indulged in it. And I was brought up to believe that my ancestors were entirely benevolent, philanthropic servants of the nation and, and then the British Empire, which on one reading they were. I mean, they, they were generals and governor generals and admirals of the Navy and fought all sorts of fights that they no doubt believed were for good civilization. They also um, made a lot of money out of the empire. They were, they were part of the looting of India. Um, one of my grandfathers was a, uh, his, his nephew was a, an heir, was a uh, trader in Bombay before he came back to um, live off the family estates in Scotland. Uh, uh, but, most intriguing is that Sir Adam was a was a liberal. I mean, he and, and a reader and a philosopher. He's got Cowper's poems, which include anti-abolition material, there in his library. The, the, the great 1786 report of the British Select Committee into the slave trade. It, it, he's got it. It's there on the band with his notes in the margins. It's the first time the British were told in great detail by a parliamentary committee, just what was going on in their ships between Africa and Jamaica. Uh, and and he, many of his friends, ministers, uh, ministers of the church, uh, in the next door, next door big house had another MP in it, who was an ardent abolitionist. So he could, he knew the other arguments. And he also could have made the decision to back abolition. He was perfectly feasible. He wasn't so in debt that, that, that it would have been financially impossible. But he chose not to. And this is where it gets intriguing because I don't think of him and his brothers, whose letters I've read, as being people so very different in culture from me, from myself. Um, they were partners with this family, the Hunter Blairs. That's not the house they built with slavery, but they did build Black One House. Uh, this man here at the Whip, David Hunter Blair. Uh, James Hunter, as he was called before his marriage, um, was the, 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 the adult there, was uh, one partner in one of the great banks, slavery funding banks of late 18th century uh, Scotland, uh, now absorbed into what Lloyd's TSP, TSP well, whatever Lloyd's is now become, I forget. Um, and a, a big enough bank, a successful bank, and then after an issue, it's a uh, own bank notes. Um, and he's intriguing in his story because while he partnered in the ownership of the Jamaica plantation with my mother's family, the Ferguson's, they were far richer and they were rich and entirely because of their banking enterprises. So when I look at their, you know, and the, the fact that they could spend the equivalent of, well, it was uh, about £40,000 then, and equivalent of £80 million pounds today, um, the uh, at the end of the 18th century, buying a massive estate in Scotland and building a brand new castle there is from their slavery money, it is from their slave banking fortune, the Forbes and Hunter that banking fortune. Uh, far, maybe about 10% of it came out of the half share of the plantations. Uh, well, they had, sorry, they own two plantations, but they're, they're, they're Jamaica enterprises. Bankers, insurers, mortgage holders, these were the, how the great fortunes were made in, in, uh, among Scottish people. Um, the, which is not to excuse anybody, I should say. Um, and again, and, and, and interestingly, from, uh, Sir William Forbes, more famous, who was his partner in this bank, Forbes Bank, it was known as, what became an abolitionist. Um, and he, uh, he helped fund, he was one of the backers of the, the first Edinburgh the abolition committee in the 1820s. Um, so you, you have to clearly the debate was going on in that class. And I say this because 
I, I get, I've had quite a lot of abuse about this book from white people of my class. And what one of their lines is, you're judging those people by the standards of today. Um, and the standards were different then. You go, I don't think they were. In 1792, half a million British people petitioned Parliament to end the slave trade. The, 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 the later abolition argument was an immense popular movement led by middle class women, sugar boycott and so on. You know, and, and, and some of the some of the few black people who were in Britain at the time. But uh, um, so they were men who knew the arguments, they knew right from wrong, and they were all Christians. It's important to stay on. So basically, I this this ancestor, Sir Adam. Never went to the Caribbean. Dispatched a younger brother to Tobago to buy a plantation, uh, which was a disaster. Plantation and eighty Africans, uh, and was a disaster. Um, the and the younger brother and all the Africans died uh, very quickly. Um, the uh, but he what, what's remarkable about him is he 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 kept every single note and he, he kept drafts of his letters most of. So when he dispatched a letter to Jamaica or to Tobago, and he often did two or three a month for 40 years, he kept, he often kept a, a rough copy of it. So, so the, this archive, which is in the basement of the house he lived in in Asia, remains there to this day, um, is extraordinarily rich. And it gives you a picture of the, man, the man's character, the obsessive nature of him. Um, a man who will write a letter two years after the death of a mule on the plantation, questioning who is responsible for the death of the mule, because this is how long the, the post gets to take to go back and forth. So there's minute, nitpicking, obsessive attention to detail uh, of a bit which of this business, which he ran for for both both families. So the hunter bears basically handed over the management to surround folks. This also, while being a member of parliament. And Rector of Glasgow University and, he, and running his own Scottish estates. Um, so I, you know, and this is part of my, my privilege, really, uh, had the luck, I mean, luck of access to these papers. I mean, these papers are accessible. It, it was easier for me as a member of the family. Um, and I can talk to anyone who wants to access them about how to help and enable that. Um, uh, uh, and spent really a, a year and more going through massive amounts of stuff, which really had very, I mean, Diana Payton's been in there and seen a bit of it, but very few have. And, and a lot of you who work in this field will know the sort of thing I was looking at was inventories here um, from periodic inventories made. This one lists um, the names of all the enslaved people on the, on the Roselle plantation in 1773. This is a time when they were thinking of selling it and trying to make a new plan to make it more profitable. It was never a very successful plantation. But here, of course, this is where you get down to the only memorial that will ever be to these people whose lives average lifespan four years at the time for an adult African person on the enslaved on the plantation, whose lives will, will never be remembered in any way. And but of course, they're not known memorials because they Look, I mean, you, you guys know this, but they, they, they're African, they're rich, their birth names were taken away from them. They were called joke names like Don Quixote or Bacchus Hannibal. Um, so that, there's that material. There's um, the death lists. So these are from the plantation books where you get the, the increase and decrease per year listed on the page before the animals and after the list of stores that have gone missing or whatever. Um, and this again is a, sna a snapshot, so you, you, but, but a lot can be, can be garnered from this. But again, it, you know, a, a, an awfully, and I, I still find it, it, I still find these documents moving and, and shameful, really. Yeah. Yeah. Margareta, an invalid, died of a flux. A female child named Violet died of fever and worms. A man named Hope died of an old confirmed pox. A man named Elliot died of a consumption. And you realise, you know, you realise just how grotesque the human toll was. 
and you realise that for really right up until the end of the 1780s, it was cheaper to work human beings to death and buy replacements than it was to look after them. Um, and then you get the, the finances, which are much more difficult to work out. This is literally one of my great, great, great uncle's notes to himself, and it's, he's, he's clearly trying to plan, make a plan to make the estate. He's always angry that the estate was, wasn't showing the profits. I mean, there were you know, a lot written about this. A lot of slave plantation owners knew what an acre of sugar should be producing on average when you took costs away. I and mean, there were figures bandied around, and he, and he never made anything approaching 50% of what he thought he ought to make. So he was in a permanent rage about this. Uh, and so here he's writing about and it's, sorry, um, the sum received, you know, the gross sums get got for the crop of 1805, which was a good year, earned them £4,444, um, outgoings, this and that. So this is just a scribbled note and stuff. And I, but this kind of sums up his character, which, you know, since this is a popular book, I hope interests me. He writes at the bottom, the above balances are all the proceeds of the estate, all expenses being deducted except a small uh, amount for postage. That's the sort of level, counting the, the cost of the stamps was the, the level of this interest. And this on, on the right hand side is a really interesting document because this is the beginning of income tax and that's a, and it's quite hard to disentangle the taxation regimes in Jamaica and also in, um, back in Britain. Uh, and that's a, a note you know, where somebody, not not around, is trying to work it out. But, um, but what what is very clear, and again, this is important in the kind of message that I'm trying to give to my readership, is that by the 1800s, the British government was taking far more from my ancestors' uh, work in, in, in enterprise in the in the West Indies than my ancestor was. It was a massive, um, I mean, the figures from my book, but this is a massive earning for the British government. And again, I mean, as, as all of you, you know, those of us who do get into arguments on Twitter and, and beyond with the denialists of the importance of slavery, these are really important things. And I, I'm currently in a fight with the Sunday Times at the moment who printed a Jeremy Clarkson article saying that the cost of the West Africa squadron policing slavery post emancipation was far greater than anything Britain earned from the slavery industries in the previous 200 years. And, and it's really hard to get this sort of denialist lie expunged, but documents like this can help you do it. I mean, the truth is, as you all know, that actually slavery accounts for about 11% of GDP in 1800. But this, this lie about Britain did that, did more fighting slavery than it ever got from slavery is very current. And, uh, and this, this um, fevered uh, world we've gone. And then, of course, the, for me, the, as a writer, the best things in the archive are hundreds of letters. Uh, not easy to get through, but we have transcribed a good proportion of them. And, and also, I'm, I'm very happy to make those transcriptions available to anybody who'd like to see them and use them. But, um, and, and what's we so the bulk of the letters are manager, Scottish manager in Jamaica to proprietor and proprietor in Britain back to Scottish manager. But then quite a few, um, and they're very businesslike. And, 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 they're, and they, they're quite horrific in, in, the sense by, in, in what they leave out, because you'll get eight pages of arguments about or discussion about whether the next shipment of sugars should be sent to Bristol or Glasgow and arguments about you know what why 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 the uh, the, the, the plantation the, the grounds that, that the where, where the enslaved people grow their own provisions why aren't they producing more and stuff like that. And then at the end you'll have a little note about annoyingly two of the young women we bought last year are already dead you know, without even naming them. So, so you comb through these letters um, and then some of them, the most interesting for me of all, are um, written between the two, the brothers, the brother who went to Tobago writes very vivid accounts, they have jokes in them, they have 
you know, great sadness and a lot of fear uh, back from Tobago to his brothers in Scotland who are back in his enterprise. And those are, are really fascinating. Because again, to me, as the descendant of these people, they said, this is a man not unlike you and you need to get on top of that fact. You can't other, other him. He's like me. And even perhaps I could have done what in the same circumstances what he did. And it's important as a white person criticizing the past to realize the past is you and not push it away. So the letters are fantastic. And, uh, and um, as I say, if anyone wants to have a look, I'm going to do a wide quote in the book, but of course they can. Um, so when, once I finished this, this um, process of, um, of uh, uh, digging through the, the, the papers in order to, to tell this story, which I realised, even I'm not a historian, but, but you know, I, I needed to do because I couldn't really see that anyone else was going to, and it seemed to me this account was important. I then had to address my own responsibilities and reactions to the story. So, of course, I did what actually surprisingly few people in my position, there's an awful lot of people in Britain who know that they're they, they have slavery wealth in their backgrounds. I, I went to have a look and, uh, and talked to people in Tobago and in Trinidad and in Jamaica, both who live, physically living in the places where, where our plantations were, uh, and, and academics and politicians and journalists and so on. And, and so I started first in Bloody Bay in Tobago. I don't know if any of you know Tobago, but the site, a very run down village unfair <laughs> putting their road sign up but a, a very poor village on, on the far from the tourist beaches in the north and, and really and actually the plantation the site of the plantation um as i say in the book is, is still pretty much returned to to secondary jungle apart from one small small holding but um and um i've had conversations at great at there fascinating conversations and, and what i tended to do was um was say to people, you know, I had to tell them who I was and why I was there, and, and then ask what what it meant to them now and how their lives were, were how slavery and the history of slavery affected their lives today. And, and that started some really fruitful conversations. And, and, and I, I mean, if none of you, you know, I mean, you historians in, in this field know the Caribbean well and, and people in the Caribbean, but you, you won't be surprised to hear how generous and kind and interested and ready to help people were and and i i felt um embarrassed really that uh, by that i mean and, and very grateful for that kindness but it, it was remarkable uh, and but also what came through and i do write this very strongly is that we never apologized we went on um uh economically exploiting those people and the Caribbean colonies right up until independence and beyond. And that, you know, the, I mean, uh, the first, so the first answer for most people to how does it affect you today was colorism. Colorism affects my life and the lives of my friends in a very real day. And, and I have to admit, I, I'm ashamed how totally ignorant I was about that issue. And, and it's just something I go into in the book quite a lot, and, it, and I needed to, to be told it. And, um, and of course, when you go to the roots of colorism and the preferment of one skin color above another, and you know, I can see it happening in my ancestors' plantation managers' letters. You know? and, and, um, and so I think for me in the end, that, that, you know, that very hard link between the slavery period and the, and racism and inequality in Britain today, you, th those things like that enabled me to, to say it. That this is absolutely inescapable. And, and white people in my country who blame the poverty of uh, the AME people in Britain upon other issues um, need to shut up and go British, really. I, I mean, and that, that's so, that was sort of, so anyway, I, I said the process, you know, looking for an ancestor 250 years ago in Tobago, the trace, traces was hard. Though it was, you could, you could identify the plantation, no problem. It was very clear, the, the landscape hadn't shifted. 
And I um, had an amazing moment with, with a, a really great man who was helping me, a couple of people who were helping me look around Bloody Bay in Tobago. And I remembered that there's an, they were under pirate attack in the 1770s. Uh, American privateers after 1776 were at liberty to raid the plantations and on that exposed northern, northeastern point of Tobago, uh, those plantations were particularly at risk uh, or vulnerable. And, um, and my, my, my great uncle James writes in 1777 rather boastfully back to saying that he's managed to get the army in Scarborough in, in Tobago to agree to install a gun. 40 pounder um, uh, for him to protect the bay from the privateer attacks and, and I thought oh man, that gun it's a heavy thing they don't go far and uh, and Junior Thomas my, my, my friend in Bloody Bay said yeah I know the gun we used to play there when I was a kid and we found it sitting there and I suddenly had this thing when my ancestor 250 years ago I could actually touch something I knew he touched and it was amazing but it also and it made the story real but it also made me think how lucky and privileged I am to know what my ancestor was doing on the 5th of June 1774 playing with the gun, because that isn't given to the descendants of those who were enslaved. Um, so anyway, I mean, to, I got to the point, sorry, I put some of my reviews up then, including, have you ever heard of this, this man? <laughs> <laughs> Little known academic in the field. <laughs> Um, and, and so, so we published this book. Um, it's so interesting. A couple of publishers. I mean, my old publisher turned it down. They said it wasn't. It you know it would, wouldn't work, and it wasn't right for a white man to write it. And, and there's kind of a point there, which I think is debate is interesting and debatable. But then, in a sense, as a descendant of this, of these people, only I could write it because it is a book about about today as well. And, 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 I, and I should say that after debate I went and kind of did the same research job in Jamaica and, and had again some really great conversations about about what about the ongoing consequences of the slavery period there. Um, and that is that's the final chapter of the book. Um, and we said we can't how am I doing for time Trevor? Uh, Boring yet? No, no, not yet. Uh, and so it was published back in May, and, it, and it's, the reaction's been really interesting. As you can see, I've got some great, I haven't got the nasty stuff on. <laughs> um, the reaction's been really great, and it was published in the States uh, end of September. But um, and I should also, it's quite important to say that I, I'm not, well, I, I'm giving the proceeds of this to, 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 to charities in, in the Caribbean and here, so I can't possibly be yet another person making a profit from, from slavery. So, so but it, it, I've had a lot of abuse about it. And, and, and that mainly, I mean, the Times and the Sunday Times newspapers did, you know, did me proud of it. And there was you know, reviews and, and, and a couple of articles as well. But, 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 but the abuse really started with readers there, uh, publishing that what publishing their reactions online underneath in the comment section. And I think, you know, we all know about online trolls and not taking them too seriously, but I mean, but, you know, you have to pay 20 pounds a month to write your, your abusive racist remark in the, underneath in the pages of the Times. And, and, and I know writers of colour on that newspaper who get it far, far worse. I mean, I don't get, I don't experience racism, I mean, I'm a white person, but it, it's, um, but it was a, it has been a real eye opener and, and a shock to see just how the Times is not a right wing newspaper, how, how liberal, educated, middle aged white Britain, you know, the, the, the depth of that racism, and also how it's couched in its kind of intellectualization. You know, and a lot of the arguments you read, and I've kept them all, and I've cut and pasted everything. I want to write something about this one day. A lot of the arguments you read are the same arguments that, that we've all read in West India lobby propaganda back in 1820. Things like the Africans are better off in the Caribbean than they were in Africa. Things like that slavery has always been important for great empires. It's not important. You know, they were saying that to oppose abolition in the 1820s and the same white people, their descendants are saying the same things today. And, and I find that blindness, 
it, you know, I do want to write more about this. It, 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 and I, but I also know where it comes from because it, it comes from my class and it comes from the really terrible history of education. I, I went to some of the most renowned schools in Britain. And, um, but I was taught a propaganda that seems to me kind of North Korea. That this great nation with its pride about its past, this great strong nation, it just could not learn the reality of 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 what you could not it was too much too much information for so we and i think almost everyone of my in their 50s and 60s in britain will agree with this were taught that world force freed the slaves and we were the good guys because we taught the rest of the world to do it and that was it and that's no exaggeration because if you if you open um our island story famous book, it's in print for 90 years, and, uh, a woman called H.E. Uh, Marshall, published in 1903. It's the best-selling English language history book of all time. If you open, I've got a 1948 edition, if you open that edition, um, which has got a lot about uh, the Holocaust and what happened in the camps in Germany, there is one and a half pages about the entire 250-year slavery period, and those one and a half pages are titled How We Freed the Slaves. So when Jeremy Clarkson and other people deny the significance of slavery today, this is this is what it comes from. This appallingly partial education, willfully partial. And people talk about amnesia. It's not amnesia. It was willful. And um, I don't. And, and I don't think we can be a healthy, a healthy Britain until um, until we start dealing with our history in a healthy way. And I think you know, it's interesting. I mean, I mean, I mean, someone here from the states. I mean, I, I mean, you know, look at the difference in how America's handled its slavery history. You know, not well, obviously, and us. But the fact, that, <laughs> sorry, that was an understatement. But, but the the fact that we, I mean, Britain enslaved far more people than the Americans ever did. I mean, America post 1776 shipped shipped ships like 300,000 Africans. We shipped 3.25 million in the whole period. But we offshored it. Now, it wasn't in Humberside and Sussex, whereas it was on, on America's, in, inside America. But, uh, but the fact that we cannot talk about this issue without people falling over laughing here, whereas it is actually on the political agenda in the States, reparations seems to me quite significant. Um, I do go in the final chapter in my book, and I'd lucky to spend some time at the uh, Mona uh, Centre for Research into, into Reparations, uh, and with Doreen Shepherd, who, who some of you will know. And um, and I I I think the, the reparations issue is really interesting. I, I, I'm I'm ashamed, deeply ashamed, that my country has laughed off the CARICOM request to start talking about reparations. It's not been the attitude of all countries. In Europe, um, and I think you know, what, 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 there are so many good models in the 20th century for how talking reparative justice and reconciliation and so on bring, can bring great results. Mm -hmm. and, and the biggest, most obvious one is the is the talks between Germany and, and Israel post war. But um, and also, I mean, what I keep saying, you know, like every time I do a bit of broadcast media or whatever, they go, what about reparations? Did the Caribbean really expect us to give them three trillion pounds, dollars, euros, whatever? And you go, so that figure was invented by colonists on the Daily Mail in 2014. Reparations, reparative justice as devised by CARICOM is, is a 10 point plan about talking about education, about technology transfer, about debt forgiveness, debt forgiveness. I mean, it, it, it's 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 a plan full of hope for us to be a, a better, happier people. And so, so I think I mean my my feeling now is, you know, this is where people like me, you know, where we need to to you know, co coalition with um, with others other groups to try and push this agenda forward. Particularly, I hope in, in Scotland, where we have a slightly more liberal government than you poor English people. Yeah. Um, but um, and I um, and, and the, one of the good things that has come out of this, which, which which is sort of surprising, you know, a lot of hate from white people, but um, but also I, I, I get a fair number of emails 
you know, really pretty, pretty much weekly from other families, other people who know their families have something in this, this in their history. They go on the UCL Legacies of British Slavery website. It's pretty easy to find out. And and they and they write to me going, this stuff. Um, we want to get involved. There's things we want to do. And to me, while you know the sort of donations my family is giving to, it's tiny in token. There's absolutely no way that we we can pay back for a thousand people and their descendants. But people who start to see there is a need are that's the entry level position into talking about reparations and national reconciliation and you know being getting serious about the roots of racism and inequality um, so i have written there's a website for the book and, and i have written about who we are who my family and these other families are supporting there's a list of of uh, and charities and NGOs and educational institutions and, and actually if anyone has any ideas for people who, who we might put onto this list to try and support I'd be really, I'd great to, I'd, it would be great to hear them and for the academics here I, 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 I do need to say we're, 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 we want to free the archive but it's it's and the, the people have been talking about this for 20 years it was offered to the National um, Archives of Scotland 20 years ago, and they said they hadn't the funds or space to, to keep it. Um, it needs digitising, again, really expensive. Um, but I, but it's very wrong, and I hear, heard this again and again at academic institutions in the Caribbean. Um, you know, it's even harder now for, a, for a, a, a Caribbean academic to get a visa to go, not just to Britain, but anywhere in Europe. Really tough. Now. And, um, so digitization is, is the future. We I talked about this at the library at University of West Indies as well. But but I, I currently have, um, and they're my copyright, so they're your copyright. Um, all that documentation in in uh, online files that I could share with you, the transcripts, and, and I'm very happy to do that. Pending some solution to to the Ferguson archive, which I hope will come. The Hunter Blair archive is is public, but it's stuck in a the Ayrshire County, you know this place, Register County Records Office, which currently is open four hours a week to the public. It's useless. So, you know, but that, that's um, that's another debate. But the whole issue around our, and indeed copyright of un, unpublished papers is, is, is a big, a big thing. I think, I think I've arrived at question point. Or it's a civil point. <laughs>
I was born in British Guiana on the east coast of Demerara in a village which was set up after emancipation by my black ancestors whose hard-earned coins doing odd jobs on the plantations they used to buy the plantations. Plantation owners who stayed on tried to sabotage some of those what were what became villages. My mother, on the other hand, grew up on five acres of what had been a thousand acre plantation, which belonged to her and her family. They, it had previously belonged to a slave owning family called the Reeds. My mother and her sister knew very, very little or didn't like to tell us what, how they came to own these five acres of a plantation called Dorfour, very near to the, plant, to, to the village where I was born. And my aunt, my mother's sister, wrote a memoir of growing up on these five acres very, very happily, which she sent to me about 40 years ago. And about 10 years ago, I decided to look at it again and try to research this mystery, how it is that they were connected, related to this read who own these plantations, including Dolphur. And uh, this is the result of my amateur investigation, family investigation of my ancestors. In her book about her family history, Sugar in the Blood, Andrea Stewart of Barbadian Heritage summarizes it as, as a history of, quote, migration, settlement, survival, slavery, and the making of the Atlantic world. I would add, of course, racism to that list, as it was a concept Europeans used in justifying their enslavement of Africans. It's a part of the story Andrea tells, and it's the story I should relate also, because it has all of those themes. In 1780, a 200-mile-an-hour hurricane, thought to be most destructive to rise in the North Atlantic, struck Barbados. The devastation it wrought added to the seven preceding years of severe agricultural and economic problems. Contemporary observers feared that the island, considered Britain's slave-owning, slave-producing jewel in their colonies might never recover. The dismal prospects of the island were what undoubtedly drove two young men, first cousins, George Reed, age 20, and Richard Reed, age 30, to seek their fortunes abroad. They were the white Protestant descendants of a family who had emigrated from the British Isles in the 17th century and had become members of a middling stratum of landowners and merchants in Barbados. One obvious destination was the Dutch colonies of Esquibo, Demerara and Barbice, which the Dutch had established in the 17th century in South America. The Dutch government granted a monopoly charter to the Dutch West India Company to trade with the indigenous tribes and later to establish settlements to cultivate cotton, tobacco, and some sugarcane. The company traded in enslaved Africans to work on plantations, which began to grow more sugarcane, to aid the rising demand for sugar in Europe. As more fertile land was being opened up for sugarcane, more enslaved Africans were imported. These colonies had abundant fresh land, but the Dutch government was unsuccessful in its attempts to persuade its own countrymen 
to emigrate, invest in the colonies, and develop the agricultural potential. Therefore, since 1738, it had been enticing British planters from the West Indies with their long experience and capital to emigrate to these colonies and offered government grant, generous grants and tax exemptions. Many took up the offer. The other destination was Newfoundland. From the 16th century, Europeans had been sailing to its seas to fish for cod. In 1763, the British defeated their main rivals, the French, and gained possession of the island, which it ruled as a base from where its fishermen could catch cod along the shores and on the Grand Banks. The cod was salted and sold as salt fish, a cheap source of protein to feed Britain's growing navy, consumers in Europe, and importantly, enslaved labour on the plantations in the West Indies. Newfoundland cod was, in the words of the then Prime Minister of Britain, quote, British gold, end quote, as it provided wealth to Britain, second only to sugar from the West Indies. Merchants were needed in St. John's, the main commercial town, and later the capital, to engage in the trade in salt fish and other commodities. George went to Esquimalt. He was residing there by 1788, as his second son, John, was born there in that year. He worked as an attorney or manager of one or two plantations in Essequibo and Demerara. You did not need legal training to be an attorney for our, our manager for those jobs. Uh, no doubt familiarity with plantation life George would have had in Barbados. The pay was five or six percent of the gross value of the produce. Several years after his arrival, George was also trading in slaves. The opportunity arose in the early 1790s when the Dutch government did not renew the monopoly charter it had granted the Dutch West India Company. That government united and named those two colonies the United Colony of Demerara and Essequibo and allowed the importation of more enslaved labour from Africa whose supply the company had been restricting. Moreover, when English planters wanted more security for their property persuaded the British government in 1796 to capture the colony from the Dutch, the government obliged. The takeover spurred huge growth in the colony, in land values, in the numbers of slaves and plantations, and in production of coffee, cotton, and increasingly sugar, the white gold. George seized his chance. Between 1797 and 1799, he, his Barbadian father-in-law, and about five others, shipped 128 enslaved persons from Africa to Barbados and in another larger syndicate transshipped 291 from Barbados to Demerara and Barbies. And he may have been involved in more such trading. Evidently, he was supplying enslaved labor either to plantations he was in charge of or others or both. Then in 1802, Long established planters in the British West Indian Islands, fearful of the competition from the United Colony, urged the British government to return it to the Dutch. Again, the government obliged, but this reversal lasted only a year. When the Napoleonic Wars began, the British retook the colony and the problems for trade and governance resulted in the Dutch ceding the United Colony and Burbese to Britain in 1814, at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. Meanwhile, Richard had established himself as a merchant in St. John's. He was one of the earliest merchants there, one of 13 who were considered principal residents of the town. 
They were very important in the civic and legal affairs of the island and in their persistent petitioning of the British government to be granted some say in the administration of the island. In commerce, he was one of a syndicate comprising George, again George's father-in-law, and several others who were exporting saltfish from Newfoundland to the West Indies. The saltfish was the spoilage of the trade, known as trash or refuse fish, the, the lowest grade. The best was marketed mainly in Europe, but the trash, the cheapest, was what planters in the West Indies wanted for their consumers, the enslaved, who had no choice in what they were given as part of their rations. The syndicate acquired six ships which made annual voyages between Newfoundland and Barbados and a few other ports from 1797 to 1805. In United Demerara Sequibo, with the security of British control and the profits he had amassed from trading in enslaved labour and saltfish, George had begun to buy plantations. He purchased six between 1809 and 1827. The largest were Dorfour, I've mentioned Dorfour before, the whole plantation where the family lived, and Lowlands, which together held about 700 enslaved workers. John Gladstone, the father of future Prime Minister William Gladstone, was the mortgagee of the two plantations, as well as another of George's. All six plantations were, were along the east coast of Demerara, thus easier for George to superintend them. He was a resident owner, although he made many trips to Barbados to maintain family and commercial contacts there. When George bought Dorfour and Lowlands, there were cotton plantations, but he soon introduced sugarcane and a steam engine to crush the juice from the canes. It cost 70,000 pounds in today's currency, but with increased production of sugar. He ran his plantations as efficiently as possible and it seems with some degree of paternalism as he and son John allowed a non-conformist missionary sent by the London Missionary Society to proselytize among the enslaved in the colonies and he, they allowed him to do so on their plantations. John even offered land for the building of a second chapel not granted by the authorities for the use of the missionary and the converts. Evidence of George's success is in a report to the British government in 1850 by the then Secretary of State to the colonies about the powerless condition of sugar plantations in the colonies after emancipation in 1838. Quote, in the year 1817 or 18, there was a mortgage on the Darfur amounting to £20,000, owing to the House of Gladstone and Company. It rose subsequently to £36,000, but the estate was unable to pay it all off. Lowlands is one of the finest sugar plantations in the district of the Demerara River. In former days and in a good year, the revenue of the farm used to be £25,000 a year." End quote. These sums are each worth the equivalent of about two to three million pounds today. But however efficient and paternalistic was the management of the plantations, nothing of course can cleanse George from his trafficking, ownership, use of enslaved unpaid labour. Another element contributing to George's success was that he was operating a family business. The names of his sons John and the eldest George Jr., the latter dead by 1830, were on the deeds of Darfur and Lowlands, respectively, and it was clear that he was also training them to take over management of the plantations. Another son, Danes, studied medicine at the University of Edinburgh 
and after qualifying in 1825, returned to Demerara to tend the enslaved on his father's plantations. In an age as ever of quacks, mountebanks, and sociopaths, an important advantage was trusted family participation. After almost 40 years in Demerara, George appointed John as an attorney for Darfur and as a sort of chief executive of the four remaining plantations for life and in trust for George's grandson. George retired with his wife and daughters to Gloucestershire, England, where he bought a mansion set in 70 acres and purchased another 544 acres of the county. He died in 1831. In 1834, the British government awarded John compensation for the loss of their enslaved workforce when slavery was abolished. John died soon afterwards and the award of uh, £29,000 for the enslaved of Darfur and Lowlands, about 30, 31 million pounds today, was collected by Baines. In addition, the family had monies from the sale around 1831 of the enslaved on the two other remaining family plantations, plus the buildings and equipment on all four plantations. One researcher of his own family history in Guyana has estimated the wealth accrued by the Reeds at about 72 million pounds today's currency. I'm a direct descendant of the other branch of the Reeds, headed by Richard in Newfoundland, who is my three times great grandfather. After he died in 1805, his son Richard Jr. managed the family's trading business but over the following years, natural man-made disasters caused the business to go bankrupt in 1818. Financially desperate, especially as he was responsible for the upbringing of his four very young siblings, Richard Jr. accepted an offer from his close-knit cousins, George and John, in Demerara, of quarter share in one of their plantations and Richard Jr. moved there to co-manage it. A few years later, however, traumatized by his experiences during a major slaver uprising in 1823, he retreated the next year to the care of a Reed cousin in Barbados and made his will. In this will, he stated that a portion of the proceeds from his share of the plantation be used to finance the completion of medical studies of his younger brother Thomas at the University of Edinburgh. In his second year and a half at the university, from October 1825 to the spring of 1827, Thomas's fellow student, sharing his classes in physics and anatomy, was Charles Darwin, who was not keen on medicine, studying medicine. Also in Edinburgh was a freed slave from Demerara, John Edmonston, working as a taxidermist at the university's museum and offering students paid lessons in the subject. Darwin, fascinated by natural history, took the course of 40 lessons and most likely the Thomas, as taxidermy was considered a helpful skill in surgical studies. Darwin later wrote that Edmundston became a, quote, intimate, end quote, awakening his interest in South America with accounts of flora and fauna of its rainforests. Thomas graduated as a surgeon in 1827 and went to Demerara to practice, perhaps because of John Reed, his cousin, who had been a sort of guardian to him since the deaths of Thomas's parents when he was around 10 years old. Dr. Thomas Reed contributed research to a report commissioned by the British government and collated by the Royal College of Physicians on the incidents, causes and treatment of leprosy in the British Empire. After emancipation in 1838, when John was selling plantations, Darfur and Lowlands in preparation for leaving Guyana 
with his spoils, he either sold or gifted Thomas the plantation house at Dorfour with the surrounding five with surrounding five acres of the original a thousand acres. According to family lore, the agent defrauded Thomas of what was intended to be 50 acres. When Thomas and his wife died, their youngest son, Robert, very keen on agriculture, farmed the land. Attracted to the family's black housemaid, Elizabeth Rogers, from a neighboring plantation, they formed a mutually consenting and loving relationship. When her formerly enslaved parents discovered the relationship and her pregnancy, they disowned her. Also, when Robert's two brothers severed ties to him, his last links with the Reed family in Barbados and England were broken. Robert bought out his brother's share of the estate. He cohabited with Elizabeth in the plantation house and they had six children. Then he was persuaded to marry her. Six more children followed the marriage, the first of whom was my maternal grandmother, Sarah Reed. Thus, Dr. Thomas Reed is my two times great grandfather. Despite having a black wife, Robert did not want his daughters to marry black men and disinherited one daughter who did. <coughs> Three others who remained at Dorfour inherited the estate as their other siblings had died or left the area. The sisters lived there at various times before and between marriages and in my grandmother's case in widowhood with her young children, one of whom was my mother, of course. She grew up on Darfur, on those five acres, very happily despite its dilapidation, as the family had no money to develop it. She took me there several times when she visited her two elderly aunts in the village and gathered some of its fruit. She and her sister had inherited the estate, but deaths and diasporas had left it unoccupied and desolate. In 1980, they sold it to the Corp Gift Republic of Guyana. And I think there's some justice that the land is now owned by the Guyanese people, whose enslaved ancestors' blood, sweat, and tears are embedded in its soil. Jenny Richardson has so many clues in the papers that they explored. Why they particularly chose to be the West Indies? Um, yes, I mean there are. I, I mean, well, what's there's a, a, a good book by a, a Scottish historian called Eric Graham who who called the Ayrshire Plantocracy. It came out about ten years ago. Short book, uh, and and he points out that the, the, there was a, the sort of a whole network of people in in Central Asia landowners, I mean gentry, uh, who, who kind of seemed to have egged each other on. And, and they were all Ferguson's one, the, the Hamilton's another family, the Castles and the Kennedys. And, uh, and, and they were all neighbours, they all lived alongside each other and married for 200 years. And, and they were all going out of there. So you kind of imagine that my, you know, I can see my ancestors who were kind of late to the game. 1768 before they made their first investment going well everyone else is at it we better we better get, get it. and they sent the you know the unemployed youngest son who left the royal navy out you know, to, to go and look for lands and africans uh, uh, and and um he um a, a draw was the fact that the truce was set that the truce with france in 1765 1760 had freed up Tobago and Grenada and, and other islands and these were being carved up by the British government and handed out as lots that you could buy. Um, but I suspect that, yeah, it was a peer pressure and, and envy of neighbours. I mean, it, interestingly, it, it's everyone else. Funny enough, when I spoke to my mother about if she knew anything of this history, she said, she said, yes, my father did mention you know, that it was a bit embarrassing. 
and that the Fergusons hadn't made much money and hadn't been involved for long. This was the myth he told his children. Um, and everyone else was at it. It's literally what my grandfather said to my mother to explain. So more than that, I don't know, but it, you kind of, you know, if you had, if your morals would allow you and you were sitting there in the 1760s with some cash, you, you know, why wouldn't you? You know, it's like, it wasn't Bitcoin, it's more reliable an investment than that. This is still a question for you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've not done any research into the Reeds original emigration to Barbados. I'd imagine at that time it would have to do with the Cromwellian period and uh, the settlement of that very early settlement of Barbados. Uh, I know that uh, there were reeds uh, in Barbados, uh, certainly by the mid 17th century, and, but further than that, I have not had time to to um, so, investigate. David also asks, uh, should we see the new family fisheries as part of the Greater Carolina in the 18th <laughs> century? Good point. Did you hear that? Uh, is, sorry, is, 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 the, is the Newfoundland, and should we also see the Newfoundland fisheries as part of the Greater Caribbean? Well, yes, I mean, it's part of that uh, development of, you know, the Atlantic trade and, of course, the connections with the plantations and, uh, you know, salt fish, uh, the capital from that, yes. I don't think Canada generally is interesting in this history. I mean, not least because the story of the, the many um, uh, freed um, enslaved people in, in the states who fought on the British side in the War of Independence um, for sort of obvious reasons, um, partly with promises of, of liberty given to them as, as a result. Um, and the then transported to Canada and their Fairly, fairly savagely mistreated by a Scottish Earl whose name I've forgot, forgotten who was governor of Canada, but he was at the beginning of, of, of a West African Caribbean, uh, West African um, community in, in the early 18th century in Canada. And this, did they go to Newfoundland? Those, Nova Scotia. They went to Nova Scotia, yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm -hmm. There's been somewhat about a lot of this Shannon Crumb. In, uh, in Canada as well as do some of that slavery passage. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Trying to remember the name of the Governor General who wanted them out. I can't remember. Also, I know he's a Scot and I think I'm related to him as well. Yeah, I'm not aware of any uh, African people in Newfoundland. Yeah. But certainly, as we see, after the American Revolutionary yeah. War. So. So, there's been very active questions. Do you want some more? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Jenny, I don't know who she is. Jenny asks Alex, uh, could you please give the citation of the book you just mentioned? I don't know if that's your own book. So, do you want to read it? The book I just mentioned. Blood Legacy. This, 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 this is my book. No, it can't be. It's called Blood Legacy. Yeah. yeah. I don't, I, Jenny, I hope that's the right one. <laughs> but I don't know. Can I publish that? Can I get? Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, that's good. Uh, do, do email me via that website, and I'm very happy to answer any questions. Which should be able to hear that. Yeah. Uh, a question uh, from Elspeth uh, Robs. Oh, Elspeth. Sorry. Which is Elspeth? Um, Elspeth was a comment ready. Was uh, she said it was very impressive that both speakers to be able to share the details of your family online, so she wants to commend you both on doing that. Uh, a question from Jeff Morgan. I don't know which one, who it's for, but apart from the work of Dr. Uh, Dr. Thomas Reed on leprosy that was mentioned, is there much evidence of effective attempts to provide medical care for the enslaved by European doctors and indeed any other research into tropical diseases? Well, I think I'm an amateur here <laughs> under a family historian, but um, the British Empire, as the British expanded into the empire, they were interested in various diseases, endemic diseases, of course, 
in these places, and not least because their own English British people were going out there to work and to settle. And there were numerous um, investigations into the causes of, say, yellow fever, uh, leprosy, which I've mentioned, and um, malaria would, of course, would be another one too. Um, the, the, the records of the, Fer the Ferguson Reserve and uh, Bloody Bay, the Carrick Estate in Tobago, uh, I mean, there's lots of snapshots of you know, day to day concerns, which are interesting. And not and most interesting of all is the uh, the medicines ordered sent out from, from Britain with sort of a complex mix of you know, mad alchemical things from the Middle Ages, seeing it through to. Through to uh, uh, in advanced ideas for, for the time, particularly for dealing with venereal disease, you know, which, which uh, as, as, um, you, you, as Trevor knows from his Thistlewood work, is a huge issue. And I go quite a lot into <coughs> the blaming of the uh, women on the plantation for um, problems around venereal disease, including infection, and of course, low birth rates. And, and of course, the mercury treatment would also contribute to low birth rate. So there's something that, you know, which you can glean from the letters, which is, is very interesting. They were um, inoculating against smallpox on the Ferguson Rizal of the States pretty early. Um, I mean, inoculating, not vaccinating, but anyway, inoculating. And, and the, the, there's always a white doctor officially attached to both the Tobago and, and Brazil plantations. A lot of complaints about his available, who doesn't live there, but the visits weekly. And then there's a, uh, um, on the Brazil plantation, which is around 200 people, there, there is a, there's always a, an enslaved man who is called Doctor. <clears throat> and one of the most interesting characters, well, in the, I had some information about him, is a Dr. Caesar, who, who actually ran away from the plantation and got all the way to London to complain about the treatment of him and his family on the plantation. It's, a, it's not a story that ends well, I'm afraid. Uh, but, but he would, I think, would have done basic doctoring and certainly mm. uh, mid midwifing skills with women and been in charge of the hot house, which is the, the sick bay, and, and also done veterinary work. May I add to that? One of the interesting things I did find was in Thomas's uh, investigations into leprosy and the British government's uh, 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 the physician's uh, research, the British government and uh, uh, British doctors were very reluctant to accept findings from the uh, empire the physicians running leprosariums, for example, that leprosy was uh, not a contagious disease. Mm. They wanted to racialize it, i.e. it was a disease of native peoples. Mm. Yes. And uh, there's a lot of interesting research on that that, uh, that they covered in that, in that regard. And that kind of there happens with venereal disease as well, because there's a confusion with yours and syphilis, right. which of course allied, and, and, and clearly a blaming, a blaming of the enslaved yeah. people for, yeah. for transmission. Yeah. And this is flying in the face of evidence where um, whites in uh, settlers in the in the tropics, they get the disease, yes. or, uh, and indeed evidence of the disease in Europe, which is where the whole research began, because there was an increase in evidence, uh, incidence of leprosy in Norway and in Scotland. A clarification, sorry, from, from Jenny, apologies, Trevor. Yeah, uh, she said, um, Alex, she, she mentioned, Jenny wanted to know which one you referred to that you used to get, was used to get at uh, the issue of West Indian peer pressure. From, from other investors in the West Indies? Well, that's really, it, it's in, it's from, Eric, sorry, Eric Graham's book. Eric it's Graham. called, if you Google it, it's called uh, the Ayrshire Plantocracy. What's that? Ayrshire Plantocracy, Eric Graham. Alicia? Yeah, 
Yeah, thank you both very much for all the research that you've done and for sharing with us. Alex, you alluded a little bit to you, um, strangers' opinions of the work that you've published. I wondered what both your families feel about sharing quite intimate, possibly family secrets. Mine, uh, I think they considered it far enough in the past that uh, they don't mind. Mine, I, yeah, I haven't published it uh, publicly, but I've spoken to them obviously about it. Um, I think I get the impression my daughter has just visited from abroad, and I get the impression that, you know, she's a bit more wary, but they're certainly my siblings. Uh, they don't. Uh, they don't mind in the least, and uh, they, uh, and I think some of them hope that we find out more about that background because it was, it's been such, as I said, a mystery in the family for so long that uh, you know the more we find out, the better. The more we find out, the better is absolutely right. I think. I, I'm afraid my family haven't been <laughs> quite as as interested or well interested. So. It's been really interesting. I, I mean, I, I, I kind of wandered quite innocently into this thinking, well, you know, it is quite a long time in the past, though it's relevant today, and, and better out than in. We need to know these things. And and, and certainly, not, I mean, not all of but, but some of the oldest members of my family have been have, are, and remain very angry. About it. And I think what, and it kind of reflects what's going on in. British culture generally is you, you challenge the history, you know, on which people, however in, incorrectly, have based their self-belief and their identity, and tell them that you know actually your ancestors weren't these saints and benevolent rulers, but actually some of the greediest, most murderous people in modern history. They find that not acceptable at all. I, I, but going down the journey, I, there's no one younger than me in the family who's anything but happy that I look at my wife over there. <laughs> who, who's anything, you know, I mean, we've kind of sewn it together. You know, we're, all, we're all talking, we're a big loving family. And many of my family members are, as I said, contributing to these charitable ideas that, that are coming up. I mean, the youngest of all, I mean, it was, I've got one young, young relative who said, you going to be really embarrassing, what about me if I'm eight? <laughs> well, it's got to be talked about. And he's come up, come up to it. Can I could perhaps expand on, uh, just a bit, bit on that, that question? Mm. I mean, I was, I was reading in the Sunday Times last week an article by Rachel Johnson, who's yes, Boris Johnson's uh, sister, who mm. said that she was very grateful that her great-grandmother was a Caucasian slave. Yeah. which I thought was pretty odd. But but, but the, 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 she started off by saying, she mentions this a number of times, is that, that, that um, uh, her husband thinks his family is more distinguished than her family, even though she's a daughter, sister of the yes. prime minister. But And, and that he mentions that he, he, he comes from people from a Norman conquest. Well, in Yorkshire, people who came over with the, with the, with the Norman conquest, given that the harrowing of the North and yes. perhaps the closest thing, or probably, probably genocide, you know, yes. a genocidal sort of war, it's nothing to be proud of. Um, if you're uh, taking money from the, uh, from the from the monasteries like the Spencers, the Russells, the yes. Cavendishes, let alone the royal family, um, you don't see them. Then you don't see them really getting particularly um, po apologetic about that. Why is it that slavery is seen as such a particularly problematic I, I think thing that to have inherited it's from? It's really interesting, and, and I think I mean, and, and the point of course is that. British British slave transatlantic slavery and, and slave and chattel slavery in the plantations affects the society we live in today. It affects the countries where we did it and affects our own country. Um, so of course it's relevant and must be told. It affects us far more than the norm the, the Normans' depredations in in, in the northeast. Mm. Um, and so, I and I I'm really confused and intrigued by it. I, and and it, it it's it's a I think you can only come back to, well, the, old, the obvious explanation is this poor history we were taught in the schools, you know, and, and people people don't like hearing that what they were taught was untrue and what the truth was much worse. But below a lot of the people who get very angry about these things, and we saw with the National Trust debate this weekend, is something deeper and nastier. 
you have to conclude, which is essentially racist. Mm. Mm. And, and, I, and I'm afraid, you know, I have to get a lot of these arguments with people and you go, well, you, why are you so determined that black people should shut up about that? Because that's actually what you're saying. It's not the issue. Mm. You are actually just saying shut up. And, and, and I think that, that's what you have to conclude. We're a more racist society than we're prepared to admit. Well, one more question from Lance. Uh, well, it's more of a statement. I'd just like to applaud you to the brief and daughter research to begin with. Like, um, you know, I have heritage in the American South, and uh, you know, no one in the South likes to talk about Jim Crow or slavery. There's even a pushback against critical race theory in the states going on right now. So, the fact that you know you guys are talking about these things, or it's, it's, it's you know, good work, it's a start. It's, it's, it's a start. You know, it's you know, something that has to be talked about. Great. Nick? I have a question for Alex. I love Red's point earlier about the archives that you've been looking at. Yeah. Um, did, did, family, did the family offer these this archive to the National Archives? It's got the lot of the ones that just sell it. No, no, it was offered. It was a, 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 the house where they lived, which um, which wasn't the house, I should say, built with slavery money for three days. Um, uh, but where the archive is stored, there was a terrible fire, and the archive was 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 ne nearly destroyed. And and the the National Register Office of Scotland took the archive, was fire damaged and water damaged, and and re and restored it and recatalogued it. And at that point, it was certainly said, "Will you just keep it?" So it is. A, it, but they said no. So it, it is catalogued by the NRAS, and and, a, and, a, and you can look up the catalog. And but it. it so it's an its ownership is with the family, but apply and you can visit it. But they, it's not very convenient. But they no, they didn't try to sell it. I, um, I think it might be problematic selling it for tax reasons, actually. But, but that's a different. But thing. if you wanted to look at the archive, then you contact the National Archives or or you know, the family. You, 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 well, Alison Rosie at the National Archives is the person to contact. But, but by all means, come to me and I'll try and do it. But as I say, I you know a lot of this stuff. There's much more in the archive. I, I can just email and we'll have to do. And a, a comment for Cecile uh, of interest in terms of you mentioned Darwin being at Edinburgh. His fellow student was a, a Senegalese uh, Orcadian uh, man who supplied Darwin with um, uh, uh, animal samples of monkeys uh, for his study uh, from Sierra Leone. So <laughs> it's interesting that the Caribbean alumni. Uh, networks and continue to expand his work, yeah. if not the links for the Caribbean. So thank you for that useful insight. Well, I don't know if you know, Darwin family, of course, were very important in the abolitionist movement. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thank you very much to Cecile and, 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 and uh, Alex for a really wonderful presentation, which I think has got us all thinking. We have some other things coming up, just such which are on the which you are on the slides at the moment, but just the ne ne next one is on the Thursday, the second of December, with uh, Professor Geraldine Van Buren from uh, from Queen Mary, uh, and who'll be talking about class discrimination and children's rights, uh, because the Wilberforce Institute is, uh, is 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 committed not only to the study of historical slavery. Uh, but also to combating uh, modern slavery and discussing that as well. So thank you very much for the audience here. Uh, thank you very much for the audience uh, online. Um, and uh, we hopefully will see many of you on, 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 on the 2nd of December. Uh, and then as you can see from below uh, on, on, on uh, events in January and, and February. So thank you very much, Alan.